What's up, everyone? Welcome to the Go Long Podcast. I'm Tyler Dunn here at GoLongTD.com and everywhere you listen to the pod, Apple, Spotify, YouTube. We continue our division by division preview with a very special guest because not only does DJ Bienname at ESPN.com do one hell of a job covering the Houston Texans, top notch, read all his stuff, listen to him on ESPN radio, you're in the presence of track greatness. Uh, from, from the great <laughs> days at, at, at Louisville, which man, I, we talked about it a little bit. What did you run again, DJ? The 100, 200, and the four by one. Oh my God. So that's, that's, that's legit. Now what's, uh, what's the personal record here? That's gotta be at the tip of the tongue. Uh, in the hundred, uh, 10, four, yeah, 10, four. So, you know, not, <laughs> not a lot, not no, uh, no allows fast, but fast enough to where you can get the school and pay for well yeah and and plus you're you're covering the text and it's got to be something to uh interview these players and know that you are faster than them if you were to race yeah 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 i always tell i, I tell all of them like you know my prime yeah i would i would be all you guys easily easily the only guy i think that on the text that would have gave me a run for my money i think in their prime uh is maybe is maybe Derek singley Derek Singley's a pretty good athlete. So I would say maybe Derek. Uh, I'm trying to think who else. Because they actually don't have that many track guys on their team. Now, on the 2020, 2022 team that I covered, Phil Dorsett was on it. And he ran track at the University of Miami. And I think he might have hit like 10-5. So he would have gave me, obviously, it would have been a neck and neck race. But that's literally it. That's only, you know, like I haven't come across that many guys. Oh, I'm lying. Troy Pride. So te- a Texans cornerback, Troy Pride, he's a four-string cornerback. I actually raced against him in college. Hey, he went to <laughs> Notre Dame. He played um, he, he played quarterback and cornerback there. And I, I we raced in the 60 a bunch of times. But I don't think we ever raced in 100 next to each other, but we raced like in the same like ACC outdoor championship. So we can talk about that from time to time. So, yeah, Which- he's actually literally beat me out of me. Not head to head, but actually, like he had ran a faster time in a different heat twice, which is amazing because I, I have always thought there's like a little like um baked in tension between the people we cover and us because it's like I, I think they some they'll look at us and rightfully so like what does this person know like they right, they, right, they, they right get right, this right. person on a football field what the hell is he gonna do and right, you know a lot right, of us right, can right, dive right, into right. like the high school football stories and you know that one mm-hmm. moment of glory and. And you can point to, you right. know, a 10 for and, and say, I, I could beat you. Let's race right now if you really yeah, want to right, take right, it there. Right. Right. <laughs> you see, you got that in the back pocket, pocket, right? If I, I and these guys get pissed off I at do. you this season. There you go. <laughs> that that you know, I'm gonna have to use that. I'm gonna have to use that. You know, I try not to make sure the guys get pissed at me, but if they do, I might have to use that to get myself out of uh, my my get out of jail free card. Why would they though? I mean, this is the the hot team right every every season there's a non-chiefs team that everybody gets excited about for a while it was these bills in buffalo and i i think that uh brandon bean and co will kind of kind of like not being that team this summer but the texans i mean you're there every day i was down there for otas briefly it seems like they're handling all these expectations the the right way i I don't know if if you could tell if they're handling it the wrong way but you know, Christian Harris is talking about the not ingesting the rat poison, you know, that Nick Sabanism <laughs> from Alabama. They they kind of get it. You know, they they know what the expectations are, but you also don't know what you don't know. They're so young. There's a value to that. You don't have those playoff scars. I, I, what, what sense do you get talking to these players and coaches day in and day out with, you know, expectations? I, I don't know the last time people looked at the Texans and said, this is a Super Bowl contender. Yeah, I would say they're doing a really good job at um, not allowing it to affect their day in and day out. Like they're, they're just going to, going about stuff like it's business as usual. Because um, I remember, you know, talking to a few, you know, Texas had a few Bills players, and they always said whenever they get, it was a week where they had to play the Chiefs, everybody got really, really tense and really, really tight, especially uh, the head coach, Sean McDermott. Um, you don't say. <laughs> So, I don't envision the Texans kind of being like that because I remember last year, um, 
down that stretch, whenever CJ came back and they were basically in like two games where they had to win, that was against the Titans and the Colts, they didn't feel tense at all. And even like the Browns game, they didn't feel tense at all, at all. Like in actuality, before the game, they're playing get back as an M effort um, in, the, in, in, in the locker room because, you know, they want to get revenge on the Browns because the Browns a few weeks prior had beat the living piss out of them. But um, this team doesn't feel like, like – they, they always say that like, we have higher expectations in the building. So whatever we think they could do, they, they think higher. And that's kind of the standard to hold themselves to. But they're not necessarily like, you know, we're doing all this only so we can win the Super Bowl. It's more like we have to take it day by day. They're, and they're doing a really good job of staying in the now, not trying to get too ahead. and trying to work day after day after day. So, you know, sometimes you get ahead of yourself. And I've I've noticed that they haven't gotten ahead of themselves. They've kind of stuck to the routine. Uh, because like, you know, early in training camp, they didn't they weren't practicing like a team that was pressed about the expectation, right? Because like, you know, first couple of days of training camp, even first day of practice, the practices weren't even really long. So it, they were kind of going through a methodical approach of ramping and preparing themselves for what they anticipate to be a very, very long season. And again, like when it comes to injuries, like they've had a few and they've been extremely cautious. You know, again, if a team was, you know, let's say hypothetically like over their skis or the pressure was getting to them, maybe the rushing guys back, maybe like we got all these reps saying da 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 da. But no, nah, they've been very methodical with their approach day in and day out. And it's been cool to see a team not allow every, you know, all the noise, all the hype to get to them. And, you know, to be fair, you know, to add in this other part, um, I think if them being in Houston also helps them because let's say this was, let's say they were in, I don't know, Dallas or New York or even Pittsburgh or Green. Yeah. Let's say those three spots. The, the media attention would be like, in terms of what they would see at practice would be through the roof. Like still the media attention is more of a national discussion point, but not necessarily what they see on a mm-hmm. local standing point. You know what I'm saying? So like practices aren't like swamped. It's still very relative to the same people that you always see. Now, if, again, they're in New York, Dallas, whatever, like those type of, you know, markets. Like, you know, I, I was covering, I remember when I was coming to Jets in 2021 when they first got Zach and Rob Asala. And there's more people at those practices than there are at the te- practices now with the Texans who are viewed to be a Super Bowl contender. So I think that also helps to where, like, they can just approach things like it's normal versus before, you know, with other spots. You would see NFL Network maybe there every single day. Where here, you see them here and there. Um, you don't see that many national people. Where with the, with the Jets, you're going to see national people every single week. You know, multiple days throughout the week. So I think that's also helped them not really feed too much into the uh, expectations or the noise, per se. Great, great stuff. I mean, th- that's such a good point, too, on the head coach kind of setting the tone. I mean, I think every team is going to take on the personality of whoever that dominant voice is. And then that's exactly what we heard here at Go Long with with Sean McDermott ahead of those Kansas City Chiefs games. Coaches and players alike that there's just that feeling of tightness that has kind of been constricting these Buffalo Bills. It just sets in and it gets worse and worse and worse as Wednesday gets to Sunday. You know, to, to his credit, I mean, we saw it late last season. He kind of overcompensated to the degree of the DeMar Hamlin fourth down direct snap. Right. But also right. with what he's saying on play to win, be yourself. He's trying to like take a tight team and make it a loose team. And that has included, you know, cutting loose a lot of players, trading one player that we'll get into later. And we'll, we'll <laughs> see what happens in 2024. But I mean, if you can like just kind of change the psychology of your team, that's something very real, something they've got to do in Buffalo, but D'Amico Ryan's, I mean, he's in his second year. He's, this is, I think the first team ever with a rookie head coach and a, a rookie quarterback to win the division. So it's year two. What, how does yeah. he kind of make this a loose team, a, a team that does look at it half full play to win, play aggressively, think aggressively. I, it's all that stuff. You can't just jam into a mathematical equation or a transaction, but right. it seems right. like guys love them and want to fight for them. I think as many like, from people I've talked to, like he's extremely positive. And that goes a long way, especially with today's athletes, right? Like, you know, I was just on Twitter earlier today looking at um, 
the, the Dan Lebitard show and he was talking like Tool was on the show and he was talking about difference the differences between Brian Flores and Mike McDaniel and he spoke about how Flores was obviously very negative and he spoke about how Mike McDaniel is very positive and with today's athletes you have to kind of be that positive influence and that that presence to really be able to reach players consistently because now these guys make so much money they have such a big following they have so many people already catching their butt you can't then try to like you can still coach them hard but they still have to come from a place of love and a place of you know pot because like again like you don't have to demean players and things of that nature and he does a really good job like he he doesn't believe like him specifically he doesn't curse at his players i used to want the texas maybe when he does that for him, he, he didn't he did but I know with the Texans, he doesn't curse at his players. He might have a moment or two where he slips up, but that's one thing he really challenges himself at doing is not cursing at his Um, because he doesn't feel like that's an effective way to reach them. And like what, what benefits D'Amico is he played in the mid 2000s and played all the way through, I think 2015. And then he jumped right into coaching in 2017. So he's been able to kind of, he's been able to see the maturation of the players into this era like because he hasn't been fully removed from it at any point since entering the nfl i think he was a rookie in 05 and i don't know 06 and he retired in 15. so he's seen all kinds of different coaches he's seen gary kubiak he's seen um he, he missed i think he missed uh what's his face bill o'brien but he was able to be with he was with chip kelly right and he kind of saw how, how good it started, how how it kind of fell off the cliff. And obviously he went to Sean McVay, yeah. I'm not Sean McVay, but Sean, uh, Kyle Shanahan was in that, you know, that that infrastructure. And it seemed like a lot of the coaches from that tree, for whatever reason, they understand the psychology of how to deal with players, whether it's Mike McDaniel, whether it's D'Amico, whether it's Sala. They all do a really good job of being able to connect with the players in a various amount of ways, whether it's, you know, with positive reinforcement, things of that nature. So I think that's one of the reasons why he's, been able to, um, you know, overall connect with the guys and guys really want to play for him because he's just a positive, he has a positive presence. And, and so when D'Amico Ryans or uh, Brian Dable, same thing with the New York Giants, like when they do get on your ass and they're riding you and they are in the moment furious, I think the player, when they know that's coming from a place of love, when they've seen how right. you talk to them day in and day out, they're going to accept that, right? It's yeah, it's kind yeah, of like exactly. an order of operations almost, I feel like. Right, 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 exactly, exactly. And players, they, they all want to be coached hard. You know, they just want to be treated like a human, you know? They don't just don't want to be demeaned. And, again, with these type of athletes, you just won't be able to get away with that at all. You know, now, if it was back in the early 2000s, that's, that's just what the culture was. But now... Yeah. So, um, you know, these have a lot now, especially now, a lot of these kids are coming in off of NIL deals, you know, like it's going to be rare that you're going to draft a first round pick that didn't have an NIL deal or a second round pick right. that didn't have an NIL right. deal, you know? So they're already coming from a place where they, they have some wealth. And I remember being in, um, you know, this one, this one chat, this one group chat that had um, an NFL player. And I remember him saying like, you can't motivate millionaires with the rah 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 stuff you know and, and like the you know old-fashioned coaching method with the cursing and all that and but well, you're not gonna motivate guys like that it's not, that's not gonna reach them you know because like in he's like in our we could just re we could just retire and just go live our life yeah. and disappear you know and be just fine so amigo's done a really good job at being able to connect with guys um from a positive standpoint but still coach them hard when need be We've got um a series co coming out soon. Shameless plug, sorry. Uh, on the Kansas yes. City Chiefs, like going for a three peat. Um, mm -hmm. and uh, Mike, Mike Michael McCambridge, who is phenomenal, he he wrote it, and he has a line in there. I'm paraphrasing. It was something like, you know, Ray Nitschke didn't have thirst traps sliding into his DMs. Yeah, you know? right. <laughs> These guys are being like they don't have any. They don't have any no men or no women in their lives. They've got women coming their direction, and I right. uh, nil deals, agents. Yeah. I mean, it, it's just right. a different world, totally different yeah. world. Not to say right. one's better than the other, but co the coaches that kind of get that will will have an advantage. Um, yeah, yeah. All right, so around here in Western New York, if you go anywhere, 
and I and this is no exaggeration. When the bills mm-hmm. come up in conversation, Stefan Diggs comes up in conversation. I, I was at a, a funeral service for a relative <laughs> last That's week, crazy. seriously, and getting lunch afterwards. And I've got relatives immediately jump right into up well, drama's out of the building. Stefan Diggs is gone. Feel like it's going to be a good season. Um, getting beers with a buddy a couple nights ago. Same deal. What one of my one of my best friends here? He's he had like a a, a little send off for his house. Him, him and his family they mm-hmm. they bought a new house, so had a bunch of people over and were talking about that. immediately first topic conversation. Well, at least Diggs is gone. Somet- sometimes I I feel like I'm living in a twilight zone because look, right. par- part of me gets and I've written about it. Like I get what Brandon Bean is saying on trying to eat the money this year so you can maybe pursue somebody next spring and going into that playoff moment with a group that doesn't have the same scars and maybe creating a leadership vacuum. So Josh Allen can have a bigger voice. Um, and Stefan Diggs wanted out and they were obliged. They, they found a trade partner. So I get it. It's not cut and dry. There's a, there's a lot of different factors here, but at the same time, not too long ago, I'm driving around town and there's Allen Diggs political campaign signs in every neighborhood. <laughs> right, <laughs> they're they're right. everywhere. So it, th- the change was like overnight. It was hard. Right. It was fast. And I feel like the narrative has kind of been lost a little here locally, not a little, a lot locally. Um, and all no, nobody up here is really seeing Stefan Diggs day in and day out and talking to him. You, you are a DJ. So what does Stefan Diggs look like down there with the Houston Texans? And what do you expect out of the wide receiver this year? And you're shaking your head as I'm saying this all. So I imagine your interpretation is a little different on this trade. Yeah, I mean, um, seeing Stefan with his teammates, it's like, what was, like, how did this narrative even be created? Why was this narrative created? Like, his teammates, from what I've seen so far, they love him. He's always coaching guys up. He's always giving guys words of encouragement, words of wisdom on both sides of the ball. I think what what I've come to notice is um, he still has a lot of, juice in the tank now he might not be the vertical presence that he once was early on with Josh Allen but like in terms of intermediate game and short game he's still dynamic as he gets and it's just a steadiness at the top of routes and separating things of that nature it's just it's been you know quite a joy to watch again like I remember it was last week Wednesday um right before the second preseason game where the Stars are going to play that is against the New York Giants he went absolutely ballistic. He went for like two big touchdowns, six catches, was almost targeted 10 times. And it looks like he's going to be number one wide receiver. But it, you know, again, like he has a big presence to him. I will say that. And it feels like this team is equipped to gravitate around that and gravitate towards that. Because the thing, a lot of these guys are like, they watch digs in high school, right? Like if you're tank, because Diggs is 31 or 30 or 31, but Tank is 24 or about to be 24, one of the two. He watched him in high school, right? CJ unequivocally watched him in high school and middle school early on, like the, the miracle game against the Vikings. That was in 2017. <laughs> CJ was still, I think, in high school at that time. <laughs> um, do you know? So like a lot of guys, like a lot of the guy, young guys, whether it's Mechie, whether it's um, Xavier Hutchinson, they watched him in high school. Whereas Derek Stingley watched him in high school or middle school. Kamara Lasseter for sure watched him in high school. So, like, a lot of the guys can gravitate towards him because, like, he's viewed as, like, the star player that they've all admired and they've all respected. And then now he's always showing them love. He's always giving them advice. They've gravitated. They've gravitated right to him. Um, and I think the biggest thing I've noticed, like, I can understand how the narrative was created, but it feels like it's because this dude really wants to win by any means necessary. Um, and when God, and when it doesn't feel like everybody else is on that same wavelength, that can frustrate him. Um, and yes, like he wants the ball. What star receiver doesn't want the ball? You, yeah. if you can find a star receiver that doesn't want the ball, I'll find you a liar. <laughs> you know, like they all want the ball because they all feel like the ball is in their hands. They can help. They can help their team win. Like he doesn't feel like the Antonio Brown type of diva. But, you know, obviously, Antonio Brown was just, you know, all over the place. Um, and, and me personally, like, I feel like every team should have a receiver that has diva-ish 
qualities in them because how often do we see a star receiver not have diva ish qualities? Larry Fitzgerald, like that's you're more likely to like, like it, that, that's way more of the exception than the rule. Most star receivers have a little bit of diva in them, and that's okay, that's what makes them great because they kind of have that burst, bad basketball personality where it's like, give me the rock, I'm gonna score, and you need that in today's NFL. So, because again, like you can, whether it's Justin Jefferson or Jamar Chase or Tyreek Hill or Devontae Adams, like watching the um, you know, the um receiver um Netflix documentary, you see Devontae Adams, yeah, he's kind of showing a little bit of quote unquote, which we would classify as diva personality or diva whatever, but it's okay because he's with bad quarterbacks, so no one calls him a diva. But that's still like the same characteristics that most quote unquote diva quote unquote receivers have is that get me the ball so I can make plays so we can win, you know? So I don't, I mean, seeing Stefan Diggs, like he's just ultra competitive and I get why people might view him as, you know, a diva or da, 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 da. But I think this team is fully equipped to handle that. And again, it's your, he, he's on a one-year deal. So yeah. he has to be on his best behavior anyway. So I don't anticipate that's going to be a problem at all. Um, and I think there's a decent chance the Bills will miss him in 2024. Maybe not. I don't think they'll miss him in 2025. But they'll they'll for sure miss what he brings in 2024. I'm I'm totally with you. Like you do need a receiver who's got some shit to him. I mean, yeah, the position inherently is 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 helpless. I mean, you can only change a game if the ball is thrown to you. You can literally. <laughs> I mean, you, you can absolutely roast the cornerback in front of you, embarrass him, embarrass him, and the quarterback can throw elsewhere or at your feet, yep. over your head. So, right, right. I, you, I mean, that was my one concern when the Bills did this trade is, okay, are they going to go this, like, choir boy direction, power rushing mm-hmm. game schematically? And mm-hmm. I think they re- recovered. You know, Keon Coleman has just been fun as hell, and he can play by all indications, had a strong camp, and they're going to use the tight ends. They're, they are going to run the ball. We'll see how that that all plays out. Um, but the big question is like his game, his juice right. that he has, like you referenced. How, how yeah, much does yeah. he have? Because I feel like the, the offense kind of changed from Ken Dorsey mm-hmm. to Joe Brady with Sean McDermott's right. strong influence and wanting to run the ball. And hey, look, they they did win against the Chiefs thanks to Kadarius Tony and beat Easton Stick right. and Bailey Zappi, and they did take it to the Chiefs to the limit before losing. Right. But um, I don't know. I, I tend to think his decline in production was more the offense. And yeah, yeah, you can yeah, hear yeah, that yeah, in yeah. Stefan Diggs' opening presser with, with the Texans. I was with you guys in the spring. Yeah. He kind of referenced it a few times that he could see where this was going. going and so many yeah, words yep. said he wanted out. Uh, right. And the insinuation on the contrary is, well, no, he, he lost a step. He, right. he is starting to look a little washed. When you do get to that age of 30 and you're not necessarily 6'4", 220, you can, you can right. go off that cliff. So in terms of his game itself, seeing him, what does he look like? I mean, he still has his juice. As I said earlier, like, he might not be the vertical down the field threat that he once was, but he can still win vertically. And he's exceptional in the intermediate and short game. He, he's... His suddenness at the top of routes is so incredible. Like, again, I've been watching, you know, this is my third season covering the Texans, so I've seen uh, Brandon Cooks in camp. I've seen Nico in camp. I've seen, obviously, Tank, uh, Robert Woods. When I covered the Jets, I saw Garrett Wilson at the beginning. Um, Yeah, I would put Stephon Diggs at the top of that heap of guys that I've just watched in practice um, consistently. Just in terms of the operation, the juice, the explosiveness, all of that. Yeah, I put him at the top. Um, he still has it. I think he's going to be in a slot a lot this year. So I think, like, he could have a high number of targets slash catches. But not necessarily, like, lead the, he might not lead the team in yards. Because, like, the other two guys on the outside, Tank and Nico, are just going to be able to, like, feast on that. Mm-hmm. And um, be able to have high yards per catch. Because I think, I think the, uh, defensive coordinators are going to, like, uh, game plan to take Stefan away first before they get to the other receivers. And I think it's going to allow those other two guys to eat. So I think his presence is just going to open up uh, um, windows for everybody else to really. Because re- again, I think that like, the passing attack is going to funnel through Stefan and 
you know, everybody else kind of getting where they fit in. But I think it's going to be an explosive trio between the three um, as long as the offensive line is healthy. I think that's the only thing that could truly derail the Texans' chances this year is offensive line and defensive line health. That's a strong take, though. I mean, I see Nico Collins and what he did last season and the way he took off his size, his speed. What a what a blend that you rarely see. And then they signed him three years, right. 72.7 mil. That's right. wide receiver one money. I mean, and then Tank right. Dell looked just as good as Nico Collins before his injury. Uh, right. But you're saying, I mean, it's going to run through digs. Like he, he might yeah. be that top. He might get the most targets out of all three. Yeah, I think he'll get the most targets. I don't, I'm not sure he'll lead in yards, but I think he'll get the most targets and receptions because he's going to be in a slide. He's going to kind of be like CJ safety blanket a lot, a lot of times. Um, so I can see a scenario where like maybe like he finishes with like, let's say there's 107 catches, like, 1,189 yards, and then, like, maybe Nico has another 1,200-yard season or 1,300-yard season. But I think it'll just come down to, like, in terms of targets. and Because, like, just watching him get practices, he gets targeted the most. And, 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 you know, some people might say, oh, maybe he's just trying to work on building his chemistry with CJ. Nah. Bobby Slow is still calling the plays, you know. And Bobby Slow designs a lot of situations for Diggs to get the ball. Um, so I think it's still going to be, you know, I think it's going to be Nico and Diggs interleading in yards. I think Diggs will live in receptions. Um, and I think Tank could probably lead in yards per catch because he's just going to kind of be, you know, get the least amount of focus, which he's going to be able to exploit that because he's so dynamic. So, yeah, it's going to be fun to watch. It's going to be a very, very explosive, um, passing attack throughout this season. Plus, like you said, it's a, it's a one-year deal in a wide receiver yeah. market that is blowing up. So he's got every reason to be a good soldier. Like, even if we did right. want to argue here that there were red flags and there were issues right. in Buffalo, which I'm sure there, I've, I've always been open to the fact that there's a hell of a lot that nobody knows on either side of right. that, that Absolutely, split. absolutely. Uh, but it, follow the money, right? Like they say in the wire, just right, follow the right, money. Right. He's got every reason right. To just play football and win a championship. I mean, he's into legacy. He's into all that stuff too. We'll we'll, we'll see what happens. But you know, right. I, just while you're on Bobby Sloak, what what do you think makes him different as a, as a play caller, play designer? Man, just sitting down with him a year ago, you, you could tell he the way he thinks is very cutting edge. And and now he's got all of these weapons t- to work with. I, I feel like we're gonna see him as a head coach somewhere very soon. Yeah, I would say on um, the thing that kind of stands out is he's he's um pretty he obviously is clever um and he tries to stay a few steps ahead like i remember the bucks game um where cj you know set a nfl rookie record by throwing for 470 yards i think five touchdowns with the game with a touchdown to tank dale what i noticed was um when i talked to him like specifically about like that game he mentioned how there was a look that he saw the bucks in but he wanted to wait just a little bit more. He wanted to wait just a little bit more to see, okay, are they really in this? And then he saved it for the first play out of the half. And when he called it, touchdown, you know? So that's one thing I've noticed is, like, he, he, he's pretty clever. Obviously, with the chess game, he, he tries to – um. my bad, my dog was about to hit my tripod. <laughs> but – that, that's impressive, man. Just spitting all these these takes while you're taking <laughs> care of a dog. I didn't for those yeah. watching, they they saw, but those listening didn't know. That, that was that yeah. was good. <laughs> but yeah, you know, just trying to again like stay always trying to stay ahead of the DC because you know again like last year was his first year ever calling plays, and the fact that there were so many times where he was ahead of the defensive coordinator kind of spoke to like his preparation, how much he studied, um, and also playing to his, his um, team strength, you know. Because um, he had he had a pretty good opening script. That's one thing I noticed. Like some some coaches, you know, a decent amount of coaches do, but some are better than others. Like the Colts game, the one that put them in the playoffs, him being able to call that play action pass for a big score, um, first play of the game. That that went a long way because it wasn't like they scored a lot of points in that game. I believe they only scored. Um, I mean, I think they scored like twenty three. That's like twenty three to yeah. nineteen or something like that. And he only had like he's only like legitimate 
receiving threat was Nico Collins. Obviously, you also had Tank Dell. I mean, not Tank Dell, uh, Dalton Schultz, but still being able to um, understand his personnel, not fit a you know square peg into a round hole. Like that's one thing I give him a lot of credit for because he's really big at putting guys into position to succeed. Um, I remember like against the the Browns, like he was toying with Jim Schwartz that whole entire first half. Half, you know, obviously CJ was delivering, but Bobby put CJ in a great position to succeed by with all the play action look, all the misdirections, all the confusions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's one thing I'll give him a lot of credit for. Like he's really good at playing the game um and being able to play the chess match. So I think going into year two, it should be only better in that regard. And because even again, even again, like I remember against the Steelers, they were down there, both of their starting tackles, they were they were rotating on the left tackle with uh, a practice squad guy, Austin Deckless, and they had re-signed uh Gerard Christian. Um I think off somebody's practice squad who played with the Texans before, but he never played under Bobby, and he was just rotating both of them, and they were still able to put up 30 on the Steelers. Because he was he was just able to call out quick hitting plays to make sure that um, CJ wasn't holding the ball long enough and when you're calling like a lot of quick game that's effective that usually means especially going for explosive that means all, your OC is really dialed in and finding the yeah. windows that the DC is um, leaving yeah, that they, you know that's voided so you can attack so he's really good in the chess game aspect that was the game I mean I think that was the one where I started to get a little sold myself on the outside the way they just absolutely mm-hmm slobber knockered the Pittsburgh Steelers. I mean, embarrassed the Steelers when they were yeah. missing all those guys on the line. What it was like 19 and in, in all that landed on IR. Uh, yep. In addition to the guys that were in and out at now you bring in Diggs and Daniel Hunter and Joe Mixon mm-hmm. and Danico Autry, all of these players. Um, it, it seems too good to be true, you know, and then, and then Kurt Warner just talking to him recently. He's like, man, CJ, CJ Stroud, can be a star. I mean, he, and he's yeah. a very yeah. tough grader of the position and he just yeah. loves this guy. Where, where could it go wrong with CJ Stroud? I mean, where, where could this maybe go, go South? If you were to, to be a, a skeptic borderline pessimist, because I'm with you, it, it's hard to find flaws in, in this offense, especially, but the entire team, especially a guy like CJ Stroud, but um, I don't know. If we're, if we're going to use our other side of the brain here, where, where could this thing take a turn for the worst potentially? Yeah, so on, I would say on the offensive side, I would say if the offensive line um, suffers, like, I think the second most important player on the team is Laramie Tunsil. I think that um, if Laramie isn't playing, uh, that could make the Texans' offensive line. Uh, I'm trying to think of comparisons. It could feel like the a little bit like the Jaguars, a little bit like the Dolphins, mm. where if they're missing, you know, one of their better guys on the offensive line, they can get really quick game-ish where you have to, like, kind of live in that. Um, and because the right side would be fine, right? You'd have Titus Howard at right tackle and Jack Mason at right guard, both really good vets. But the whole left side, the rest of that would be guys out of your three tour rookies. Like Fisher, who's still very green as a pass protector, um, Kenya Green, who's very green at the pass, still very green at the pass, even in year three, and the Drew Scruggs, um, who's going to year two, has only played, he's played less than 10 games in his career. So you'd have a lot of inexperience on the left side of the line that still needs development. And it, it, it can work when you have Larry Tunsil at left tackle because he'll be able to elevate the left guard because he's just an elite offensive lineman. That's what elite players do. Elite players just elevate guys around them. Um, so he'll be able to do that, but without him, it can get really tricky because then you have a lot of way more muddier pockets, which can lead to more mistakes. Well, yeah, CJ can still like deliver the ball where he needs to go even when pockets are muddy. You don't want to live in that at all. That's not, that's, that's not the place you want to live in. Um, and I think that if because I, when I was watching, you know, this past game against the Giants, there were a lot of plays that if it was like a pure drop back passing attack, CJ would have been sacked. Because like, you know, some guys were getting beat fairly quickly. Now there are other moments where people held held up. But all it takes is what? Six plays like that that can completely change the outcome of a game. 
where it's, let's say it's a third down and someone gets beat really quickly and CJ is under pressure and you try to force a pass and he gets intercepted or you get sacked and that ends a drive and it's a critical moment. Because again, like every game comes down to like five to seven-ish critical plays, you know, in the NFL. Now you have your few games where it's a blowout from like Jump Street, but the majority of the games coming up to the fourth quarter um, where it's a one-possession game and it's about who can make a play or not. Right, the Texans benefited off of that last year. I think they went seven and seven and three in one position games uh, last year, which is why they were getting to the playoffs. So I think that if Laramie's not there, it could make their offense line really, really choppy, and they, and they wouldn't be able to run the ball. That's one thing I, I I'm very confident in. So like a lot of it would rely on CJ Stroud's arm, um, and if everything has to flow, because what, what also helps CJ kind of take that, you know continue to ascend was when they put Devin Singletary in the starting lineup and he was able to give them some, it wasn't great, but he gave him some balance on the offense, you know, in the running attack, like some balance. Cause even though he didn't start, he started, I think like week. Cause then uh, Damian Pierce originally got hurt. Uh, he finished almost a thousand yards last year and he didn't start every game. So if he would have played every single game, he could have got a thousand yards, but that helped. CJ continued to be efficient, you know, like kept the offense somewhat efficient where it could be balanced and it wasn't all on CJ Stroud's arm. Because I don't, it doesn't matter what quarterback it is. You don't want all of it to be on the quarterback's arm, right? Like we see Mahomes, yes, like Mahomes is great, da 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 da, but he has an effective run game that he can rely on. Josh Allen down the stretch last year where he was able to make that push and go undefeated down the stretch and steal the division from Miami. James Cook, you know, emerged, right? Was Lamar. You know, same same ordeal. Joe Burrow, when he got to the Super Bowl, I think Joe Mixon rushed for 1,200 yards that year. So if Laramie's out, they really wouldn't be able to run the ball effectively at all. And then you would have a choppy offensive line from a pass protective standpoint. So that's where – I don't, so I think CJ is going to continue to extend regardless. So he'll be fine no matter what. But just in terms of, like, it's fine in terms of, like, when you look at the end of the year, you'll see his numbers and he'll be fine. But I think that it could still cause issues um, in critical games. Because, again, like this year, it's not like they're going to avoid good defensive lines. They're going to see, you know, Detroit's defensive line. They're going to see – I think the Bills should have a good defensive line this year. They're going to see the Cowboys' defensive line. They're going to see if, you know, Miami's uh, outside linebackers are healthy. They're going to see that defensive line. The Jags' defensive line should be really good with Josh Hines Allen and um, – uh, Trayvon Walker and Eric Armstead. The Colts have a good defensive line. The list goes on and on and on of teams that have on their schedule this year that have really, really good. The Ravens, the Chiefs, again, like just all these just pop in my head, like right now, <laughs> you know, of teams that have good defensive lines, right? Like the uh Vikings game, right? Like, and I and Laramie should he should be fine. Like, he'll 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 play week one, but he hasn't he hasn't played any preseason game and he just started practicing last week. But even like the Vikings week, right? Let's say let's say hypothetically Laramie wasn't available for that for that game. You're gonna get a Brian, Brian Flores led defense and him as a defensive coordinator can absolutely mm-hmm. you know break your brain as a quarterback offensive coordinator pass protection mm-hmm. because he just knows how to manipulate your pass protection. And if you don't have a guy like a Laramie who can make sure everybody – help make sure everybody's on the same page, along with a second-year center who hasn't – again, at that point, where I wouldn't – that would be a tenth game. <laughs> and he's in charge of the pass protection. It can get really dicey, right? So for me, it's really like the health of the offensive line is, is the most important thing because if they don't have that, then it's going to um, limit – how good this offense can be. I, I know because it's, it's not like necessarily fun to talk about, but look at all the teams that have tried to challenge the Chiefs. I mean, Joe Burrow and the and the Bengals, it's all it takes is one play. Chris Jones singled yeah. up, the movement of the Literally. outside, gets a sack, season over. And yep. if you can if you can give CJ Stroud time, I mean you tweeted out uh the clip of Stroud, I'm, I'm looking at it right now. I, I didn't know he had this kind of arm strength to drive yeah. it deep. Almost 70 yeah. yards in the air, as you know. Yeah. Got called back. But if you could just give him that extra second, man, that 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 could be a game changer. Like you said, it comes down to, you know, four or five plays every game. Uh, right. 
we should wrap here though. I mean, Jaguars, Colts, Titans, which team do you think gives the Texans the their best punch here? Yeah, Colts easily. I think yeah, I still think it's the Colts easily. Um again, they they were a drop pass from beating the Texans last year. If Gibson, um, oh Goodson, actually, if he catches that pass, if Gardner Mitchell makes a better pass, I have players in the locker room telling me, oh yeah, if he catches that pass, we'll probably lose the game. Right. So they're, you know, they added some more pieces. AD, AD Mitchell has looked good throughout um Kenny Campbell corner to all the reports. You have a healthy John Material who was taking over that game until he hurt his ankle. And if he was healthy, he probably they again, if he finishes that game healthy, they probably win that game too. Um, because he probably would have been in on fourth down instead of uh Goodson. You had you add an AR who, if he's healthy, he can stay healthy, will be a, obviously a very effective quarterback for them. I don't know if he'll like take the league by storm or anything like that, but what he can do with his legs can cause will will cause some issues for some teams and it can cause, cause some issues for the Texans. Um mainly because the where the 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 strength of the Colts is is the you know the interior with the with the offensive line and obviously you know the running game, right? And you know, being able to get up the A gap, B gap, things of that nature. And obviously, you know, get AR out on the perimeter, blah blah blah. blah. So one of the weak spots for the Texans right now, right now is the spine, right? The spine of the defense. Aziz Al Shahir is gonna is look phenomenal throughout camp. No questions about him. However, the D tackle spot. There, there's, there's genuine guys, right? Guys that are solid, that have had, that's had success at certain points in the career, but the journeyman guys, right? Along with right now, the, the linebacker that caught the pick six against the Browns in a, in a playoff game, he's missed basically all of camp with a calf issue. And with soft tissue injuries, those are, those linger throughout the year. Um, so he's going to miss some time. And I think there's a decent chance he won't play in week one. And we'll see when he gets back because he has a calf injury. And you don't want to rush those because calf injuries can kill you. Um, so right now there you have either low drafted guys or undrafted guys who haven't really done much in the league. So that's, you know, because like, again, like on the perimeter, it's, it's a wash. I think Derek Sting will erase whoever they put on that side. And then, you know, uh, uh, Kamari Lasseter, it'll be a good battle between whoever's on his side and Jalen Petrie and, you know, if Josh Downs could play, that'd be a good battle. But overall, though, where the Colts are going to want to exploit the Texans is actually, you know, their strength while also being the Texans' weak spot. Because them losing Southern Rankings and Malik Collins last year, well, from last year, that's a, that, that's a big loss in my eyes because those two guys were responsible for a lot of sacks that Gennard and Will got because they're able to always collapse the pocket from the interior where, you know, Will and Gennard could have cleaner um, rush lanes to get to the quarterback because the quarterback had nowhere to step up to because those two guys were creating havoc. So now you have Foley Fantacasi and I think it's uh, Mario Edwards, both, you know, solid vets, but they don't give that type of pressure in the pass game. And I think your know, coach can match up with them in the run game. So that can neutralize what makes this defense effective and when we can make play at its best when you can get knocked back on the offensive line. So I think with the Colts, the Colts are actually kind of built to handle what the Texans want to do, where the other teams, I don't think they're built to handle what the Texans want to do. Because Jags defense, the Jags offensive line isn't good. So the Texans will be able to exploit that even with okay defensive tackle play. And the Titans you know, the offensive line is kind of makeshift anyway. And they're going to have some young people on it and things of that nature. So the Texans match really well against those two teams where the Colts are equipped to handle whatever the Texans are going to throw at them. So I would say the Colts yeah. are pretty equipped to handle um, the Texans on both sides of the ball. We, we forget how close that game was. <laughs> you know, right. I think w- w- with everything that's happened in the off season, at, at least I have, I, I mentally have just kind of put the Texans on another level, uh, but the Colts did all of that with Gardner freaking Minshew. And and now you bring <laughs> Anthony Richardson back, who right. could be just, God, he could be fun as hell if he can stay healthy. I mean, that's a whole other yeah. conversation. I, yeah. I think that's why I still kind of lean Jacksonville. I don't know. I 
I'll go down with Trevor Lawrence. I, I still think, you know, he's been the chosen one since he's been out of the womb, basically. Uh, but I, I love the offseason they, they've had. And you mentioned their D-line. I think I think the coaching is solid. So, well, it's going to be a fun division. I mean, this this used to be the pinata division that we all mocked and memed and made fun of. I mean, right. I right. mean, even the Titans could be sneaky, you know, week in and week out. Which, which is why I, when I always talk about the Texans and winning the division, I always mention their schedule. Because, like, unless you think they're going to go 5-1 and one or 6-0 and one in the division, then the schedule has to matter, right? So the fact that they now have a first-place schedule is going to make the path towards the play, um, towards when re- repeating as champs much, much harder. Because let's say they go 4-2 and two in the division or, God forbid, they go, they go 3-3, three and three, they can kiss the division goodbye. Because there's no way in the other 11 games that feature Detroit, Miami, um, Cowboys, Ravens, Chiefs, Bills. I'm, I feel like I'm missing one more team that, that, that Packers. There's no way they are going to go 7 and 0 in those games. There's just no way they're going to go 7 0. They're not going to go six, and they're probably not going to go 6 and 1 in those games. If they go 6 and 1 in those games, then they're probably a uh, a Super Bowl contender, like a legitimate Super Bowl contender, but the chance of them doing that is, isn't that high because most teams don't even do that. So with that hellacious schedule, if you go three and three in a division, let's say you go, let's say in those seven games you go four and three. Now you're kind of looking at what, if my math is right, four, but you're looking at yeah, you're looking at seven and six. So now you have to sweep through the. Vikings game, the Bears game, the, you know, you know, some of those other games that are, I guess, a quote unquote lesser opponents, you know, Patriots game. And we know the NFL, the chances of you sweeping through all of that is very, it's very slim to none. Like teams always have those games where they like lose to a team they have no business losing to, right? Like the Steelers, they made the playoffs, but they lost to the Patriots and the Cardinals back to back weeks. The Bills lost to, the Broncos, right, okay. on Monday Night Football, right? The Dolphins were up 14 with, like, three minutes to go against the Titans, and they lost that game, and that basically cost them the division. Or um, the Cowboys, who lost to the Cardinals, right? Like, every team is going to have – the Texans did. They made the division around. The Panthers had two wins. You know who one of those wins was against? The Texans. So, like, you're, every team is going to have one or maybe two of those clunker games. So, if they go three and three in the division – the path to repeating gets so much more narrow, you know? So they would basically have to like go like five and two, six and one of those really, really tough games um, against playoff team from the previous, you know, playoff teams of last year to where the, you know, all right, them going three and three is no big deal, but the vision, yeah, you said it's going to be tough. It's going to be really, really tough. Do you have a prediction for us? Are you, are you saving it for your uh, your ESPN unveiling? I'm sure. You... So, so I said on Mina Guys podcast that they were gonna go. Uh, I think I said the Colts were gonna win a division. Um, wow. I kind of yeah. So I did say that. I have kind of contrarian. I respect it. Yeah, I kind of pulled back on that just a tad bit. Now it's more of a toss up for me. So I'm still. I still want. So this week we'll give you my answer. I want to see them against another, you know, playoff team and join practice with the Rams. If they're tossing them around, then I'll switch it back to the Texans. But if, it, if it's happy-ish, then I'll, you know, I'll probably stick with the Colts overall, mainly because, um, you know, just, you know, I think they can fit. I think they're going to make the playoffs. And I think they'll be 10. And, I think at the bare minimum, they'll be 10 and 7. And I think they'll get in um, at 10 and 7. Mm-hmm. Um, the difference is, all right, because, you know, can they get to 12 or 11 to win the division? And that, you know, I still want to see uh, if they're really, really built to handle the onslaught that they're going to see this year. Um, because, you know, Rams were a playoff team last year. So if they struggle with that, if they struggle with that team, then that'll let me know everything I need to know in, in that regard, you know. So, yeah. Well, DJ, I, I got to thank you, number one, for – taking all this time that was spectacular for uh so thanks so much for carving it out and also i I didn't even tell you this i gotta thank you for 
preventing our house from burning down last week. <laughs> and I, I'm dead serious. So uh, I was in Cleveland doing Browns training camp and I noticed it then, but my computer charger was like, like the, the big part that you plug into the outlet was yeah. really, really hot. Like, I don't know if that's ever mm. happened to you, like, like boiling. So I, I put in the order on Amazon, but you know, it takes a day to come in. And that was right when we were going to record last week. Mm. And we had our days mixed up and everything. Right, so right, th right. thank God you did, because when you, when when we realized that we weren't going to be podcasting last week, I unplugged the charger and I there were sparks and wow, really? was like too hot to touch. Yeah, I got a little greedy. I mean, I knew that it was problematic, but I was like, you know what? I, it, this can get me because it worked. It was charging and I was at like 10 percent. Right. So I'm like, this will get me through a podcast. But but you saying that you know what you thought i was talking about this week when we're recording right now we'll take it to that extreme you you saved our family's home dj bnma so thank you so much anytime i could be a help i'm glad to be a help <laughs> you're the man uh so everybody can find you on twitter x at dj bnma b-i-e-n-a-i-m-e -E for yes, all of the fantastic analysis Texans or otherwise. And also you have a great story pinned how Snoop Dogg's youth football league shaped CJ Stroud Reddit. It's fantastic. Everybody carve out some time for it. Very original, fresh story there. So thank you so much, DJ. We'll see you down there in Houston. Hopefully this season. No problem. Thanks for having me.